Whether you visit our many historic sites, explore our thousands of acres of parks, launch a business, or study at one of our acclaimed universities, you'll agree, Mercer County has it all. Mercer County, picture yourself here. Mercer County Executive Brian Hughes and the Board of Commissions are proud to sponsor Mercer Local Influencers. Presenting Mercer Local Influencers, featuring leaders in our community whose positive influence is bringing energy growth and vitality to Mercer County. Presented by YourTownTube.com, FitFeb and WellTube, and Stimulus Brand. Welcome. Thank you for joining us here on the set of Mercer Influencers. This is John Gertica, your host, and I am so pleased to have Tom Zaki with me today. Tom is the founder and president of TerraCycle and Loop. That's right. Tom, welcome. Thanks for having me. Tom, this is a familiar territory t for you, but your story begins much earlier as you and your family um, came from Budapest yeah. to Canada. And uh, it wasn't necessarily an easy trip for your parents. How would you describe that uh, as it, it was a formative uh, event in your life? Yeah, certainly. So I was born in Budapest back in the early 80s in 82, um, which is, I think, probably only relevant to the story because it was still under the Iron Curtain. I mean, now with what's happening in the Ukraine, you know, same sort of sort of thing where we're under sort of, you know, under Russia and back then also communist. And uh, in 86, uh, Chernobyl happened, uh, which mm -hmm. destabilized the borders. And my parents always wanted to leave, but this gave an opportunity to effectively escape. And the next three years uh, were just basically going, trying to seek asylum in some country, you know. Uh, so it was one of these classic going from the east to the west in Europe immigration stories. Uh, but a lot of time I remember spending in line, uh, you know, trying to get asylum in Germany, then Holland, then Belgium, and then finally uh, was able to land in Canada uh, at the age of seven and uh, grew up there. And for me, uh, you know, beyond the normal sort of struggle of what it's like to, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, be a refugee, I think much, much more important was for me this transition of seeing what it's like to live in communism to effectively North America, which is the heartland of capitalism, and that gave me the bug for entrepreneurship and all those things. And you also watched your parents have to take recertification in Canada yeah. and begin their practices, their medical practices there. Yeah, they had to start from the very beginning, right? So, uh, you know, I appreciate this much more now than I did as a child, but, you know, they left from running their departments and hospitals in Hungary to having to start internships from the very, very beginning. And so they did a full reset. Uh, uh, and in that field, in the medical field, that takes a while, too. So yeah. it took probably 10 years to get back to where they, where they had left off. So there must have been a sense of courageousness in, in them doing that um, and industriousness, industriousness uh, that you picked up. And, and, yeah. and, and it seems to me that you, um, you began your work um, in many ways in high school. You were doing web design for... Yeah, you know, for me, what it taught me is that you can really achieve anything if you put effort behind it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that's actually what I've now, like in looking at team members and looking for where I can see folks that I want to be around, the number one thing I always look for is that ability to grind. Everything mm -hmm. else can be learned and so on, but it's the, and grinding is that, you know, it's putting 10 years in to regain where you were. It's, it's not just doing it one day. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, since we didn't have access to entrepreneurship back home, this idea that you can work hard and take an idea and build anything you wish, I mean, that is a wonderful uh, uh, thought and really inspired me um, uh, at the very beginning, which is why, yeah, early on, loved the idea of starting ideas, companies, you know, none of them were very big at the beginning, but, you know, I had my first employee at 14 years old, that was sort of a thrill. And you found yourself then a student at Princeton University early on, uh, late 90s? Uh, that's right, on. well, uh, early uh, 2001 is 2001. when I landed here, um, and, uh, uh, you know, it was sort of, it, it, Princeton was, was, was a phenomenal experience, and I love school, I still have the privilege to go back and lecture, uh, you know, once in a while. Um, but I had this big turning moment there. Uh, uh, in, you know, my first foray into entrepreneurship, I honestly, it was probably more for selfish reasons. I figured, you know, access to fame and fortune, do what I want, you know, these sort of more, you know, self-indulgent uh, uh, desires. And I remember this so clearly. One of the first classes I took at Princeton was uh, Economics 101. And the professor gets up on stage and asks a very reasonable question, you know, what's the purpose of business? And the answer she was looking for uh, was maximize profit to shareholders mm -hmm. as the reason of being. And you know, it felt a little uninspired to me. Uh, and that took this sort of journey uh, for me where I sort of landed on maybe profit is an indicator of health, very important, 
but it's more of an indicator of longevity, robustness, these sort of things. And then it leaves room for what is the real purpose of business, and that is perhaps how much better you can make things, you know, society, planet, both. And that's been a bug that hasn't gone away since. And in those formative Princeton yeah. years, you were finding yourself um, with a thought to say, hey, how can we create that sense of shareholder value, yeah. um, but do so in an entrepreneurial way? And um, you, you found worm poop as the, the vehicle to do that, which yes. is an interesting find, but there's a story behind that people can read. And, yeah. But uh, you put together a team then that um, worked in the area, and we are in a, in a building where uh, I think the, the Prince and Police used to be housed, and yes. they found you one night going through dumpsters and re recycling They bins Yes, I remember this building actually <laughs> driving know? up okay. because of, uh, you know, so we were doing the worm poop thing. Right. Um, actually had an office on Nassau Street just near the Red Onion downstairs. So that's where okay. I had moved out of the dorm rooms, moved into uh, uh, the basement office. And uh, no one wanted to finance this worm poop idea. Mm -hmm. And so we decided we need to start selling some of it, but we couldn't even afford packaging. So we went through all the soda bottles in the Princeton area, right. sorted them out, which is what the police did not think was a great idea. So right. I had a chance to learn a lesson in, in these halls uh, on that. Um, but it taught us a lot of unique things about waste, right? So in the world of soda bottles, waste is very standardized. There's only four types of volumes. You know, everything, the only difference between a Coke and a Pepsi bottle assuming the volume is the same, is the silhouette. So you can run them through high-speed bottling lines. Like mm -hmm. all these really interesting things. And it's been, you know, starting from worm poop to where we are today, waste has been the central, you know, sort of fascination, if you will. Right. Because it's this topic that we want to be as far away from, you know, out of mind, out of sight, um, sort of like, you know, what we do with stuff we put in a toilet. Um, but yet it's filled with unique anomalies and opportunities to innovate in a, in a very purposeful way. And um, that, um, that uh, not idea, but the reality of waste has just doubled, tripled, quadrupled, multiplied, multiplied over the years since, I think you point out, 1950, where it really became an issue for um, most Western yeah. countries. But now it, it affects the whole world because those products end up in our oceans, they end up on our beaches. So um, the, the work that you're doing, we'll talk about in, in the second half, but your team found its way to Trenton, where you set up Trenton. Yeah. Um, and Trenton's been a good place for you? The best. I, I am, to have to say, I, I am shocked more business leaders don't put their, their uh, especially their people, like their offices, uh, in Trenton. You know, if you think about it, just you know, it's taking a step back, and I'm not American, and I was like, I saw this, and I'm like, this is the best place to be. It's, we today draw talent from Philadelphia all the way to Manhattan who come in every day to Trenton. So think about that amazing radius of talent draw. Um, probably can't get more dense and more, uh, you know, more choice of people than, uh, you know, than this radius. On top of that, it's an incredibly, you know, good port. I mean, there's, you know, water access, rail access, everything you need. And it's incredibly affordable, lots of space available. Uh, the government officials, from the mayor to other folks who are there to help, are going to proactively help uh, and make you succeed. Um, it is incredible. And we've operated there uh, as our global headquarters for 15 years and have never had a crime event of any kind. I mean, nothing. So, you know, some of the stigma doesn't actually play out. And I, you know, I look at this and I can't, there's no other place, I think, you know, uh, north of New York, south of Philadelphia, all the way in that offers all of these, these I think, incredible compelling reasons to locate there um, and it's just shocking people don't I mean it's you know everyone's a sucker if they don't try to you know put a put a headquarter into into Trenton and it has a bridge that has a sign on it that you're uh, one of your teammates has considered re remaking reusing repurposing sure now I mean Trenton makes the world takes here maybe it's a bit more the world makes and Trenton takes um, is, is at least what we try to bring to it um, but no, for me, I think it's a really important message, especially anyone who's hearing this, who is thinking about where to put uh, you know, their team or an office, uh, whether a startup, uh, all the way to an established organization, mm -hmm. really have a hard look at Trenton. Uh, I, I think you'd be very, very, uh, uh, it, it will work on many levels, you know, from an e economics to talent, you know, all these different pieces. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I'd like to take a little break for a moment for a message from one of our producing sponsors, Tom McManaman at Stimulus Brands. We'll be back in a minute. How do you bomb-proof your online image? In terms of your online image, which sadly is a very real image platform, now it's much easier to take a preventative approach than to wait until disaster strikes, avoid controversy, or your own character assassination in what you like, share, or choose to post. 
Every professional now understands that you can't have a keg party or flashy pictures on your online profile. But it's not just the presence of bad things that's a problem. It's also the absence of good things. Today, everyone is judged by their online presence. And what does that say about you? As long as you're creating content that is targeted and professional, you can even bring a personal element into it. However, however you choose to do it, you want your online presence to show you're mature and professional and be true to your brand. Those who utilize social media positively are well prepared for opportunity when it comes knocking. Learn more at stimulusbrand.com. Curious about our nation's past? Learn about our history while enjoying its fresh air. See the story of heroes and villains. And don't forget to read about how soldiers lived or just ask them for yourself. And finish the day with a casual stroll. Come visit us again soon. We've missed you. Mercer Local Influencers is powerful. Mercer Local Influencers, sharing is caring. Mercer Local Influencers, it's powerful. Mercer Local Influencers, sharing is caring. Mercer Influencers, sharing is caring. Mercer Local Influencers, powerful. Mercer Local Influencers, sharing is caring. Mercer Local Influencers, sharing is caring. Mercer Local Influencers, caring is sharing. Princeton Mercer Local Influencers, sharing is caring. Mercer Local Influencers, sharing is caring. Princeton Local Mercer Influencers, sharing is caring. And we're back on the set here at Mercer Influencer with Tom Zaki, our guest, founder and CEO of TerraCycle and Loop. Uh, today, TerraCycle and Loop are um, an international organization yes. and, and known throughout the world. Um, tell us a little bit that, about that process and the, and the relationships you've forged. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, maybe where we are today, and then sort of to, you know, take a step back. So, TerraCycle is, uh, you know, we're just about a $100 million enterprise. We're national in uh, uh, 21 countries. One in Thailand is a nonprofit organization, so it's a public charity, and then everywhere else is a mission-driven uh, for-profit. And uh, in all, so half the staff is based out of Trenton. Uh, that's our global organization and our U.S. organization. And then we have satellite offices in Aurora and soon North Carolina, and then, you know, all these, all these regions. And the, the service we provide is this idea of how do we move from linear systems, call them take, make, waste, you know, like anything from a toothbrush to, uh, uh, to a plastic glove where we use it and then dispose it, to making sure it's collected and recycled, 
then making sure it's made from recycled materials, then how do we even shift it to reusable and even more innovation on top of that. Um, so throughout this process, you know, we've been able to now partner with just about every major consumer product company, uh, most major retailers in many of these countries. Uh, and the way you would interact with our services, you may go into a Walmart and see a TerraCycle collection bin all the way to a L'Occitane en Provence, or you could see the TerraCycle logo on about 50 billion packages uh, that now have recycling solutions through our free services. Mm -hmm. And in that process, this concept of the loop, mm. and therefore the name, uh, is derived yeah. to sort of tighten that loop That's in right. that process. So it, it, uh, those um, products uh, can be used and then the containers recycled on a, or repurposed or reused in, in a quicker, uh, more efficient manner. You're exactly right. You know, so we had for, say, the first 10 years of our business focused on recycling the non-recyclable and then added on how do we help companies make their products from waste. And that creates a loop, but a recycling-based loop, which we would argue is the best thing to do with disposable products. Now, we thought a lot about, okay, how do we go deeper than that? And you mentioned, I think, you know, quite accurately, waste was invented really in the 1950s. Right. And if we think about what was life like before 1950, you know, we cobbled our shoes, we mended our socks, we got milk from the milkman, things that don't happen today. And so we repaired and reused quite a bit. And so disposability is the real shift that happened in humanity around the 1950s. And we, ha we can vilify it, of course, for all the garbage it produces and everything, but it also brought about unparalleled convenience and affordability. Right. So as we thought about what is the root cause of waste, uh, what we landed on is disposability. And so the, the third division, which uh, is now called Loop, was about how do we solve for that, but by really honoring its virtues. Uh, and Loop is effectively a platform for reuse, uh, where consumer product companies from Nestle to Procter & Gamble come in, produce reusable versions of their products, and then retailers from Walmart to, uh, uh, in the US to say Eon in Japan, sell them to consumers. And all you do is pay a deposit, which you then get back when you send, you know, uh, uh, drop off your empty, dirty container, and from there, it just gets refilled like a milkman model. So, in partnering with those mm. organizations, you're partnering also with their their staff, their creative staff, yep. their tech staff, their design, and 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 there's an interaction between your team and the larger manufacturer's team, correct? Yeah, absolutely. In, in Loop, it is incredibly robust, uh, the partnership, and touches all tentacles. Because we're going to, you know, say, a Unilever and saying, can we make that product, you know, your laundry detergent, can you make it in a fully reusable uh, system? Which, the tip of the iceberg, the part you see, is the container may move from, say, being a plastic laundry detergent jug to uh, stainless steel. But there's a lot more behind that. You have to go through intense health and safety protocols. You have to produce new ways to fill it. Uh, uh, this whole idea of the package coming back and all those unique challenges it presents. Right. The financial handling of deposits and packaging as an asset instead of as a cost. And you can go on and on and on, but it touches all the different tentacles and verticals of the organization. And that's what we have to click into and make sure that they can produce you know, these uh, products and put them out on the shelf and make sure folks can access them in an affordable way. And you're often leading that discussion that yes, this creates uh, supply chain challenges, yeah. but by going through that, your teams and our team can effectively find solutions that, again, go back to keeping the costs low for these products, yeah. making them available, but also making the containers which they come uh, within which they come, reusable, recyclable. I think you're absolutely right. And look, the biggest lesson I've had in 20 years of driving the sort of sustainability type activities is convenience is king amongst all else. Uh, and convenience for the consumer, right? So the, the consumer likes a throwaway uh, 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 world, not because of the negative it produces, but because it's hyper convenient. So we need reuse to feel like disposability. Right. But not just for the consumer, it has to be the same, uh, uh, to your point, for the actual company who's enabling it. How do we make it the least amount of change in their system to enable the biggest benefit to the environment? And that, I think, is really what is the center of what's driven success for us, uh, uh, because otherwise we're relying on behavior change and you know work hard and so on, all things that are, don't come as easily. Right, and back to that economics 101, which was deliver shareholder value. <laughs> right, that hasn't shifted. Right. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of, especially if you look at like the environmental activists, right? right. Um, a lot of uh, folks are questioning whether capitalism can become um, benevolent from an environmental or really sustainable from an environmental point of view. And I think that's an open question, mind you, because business has this insatiable appetite. 
but what we have to do is to try to get business to shift is to show them how they can still meet that appetite while being significantly better for the environment overall. And as we're seeing the way the world is going, um, uh, I think there's more and more, uh, more and more of a rally and a discussion around doing exactly that. Well, that's great, and I'm so glad you're part of it. Uh, you represent the, the, the best of, of our area, uh, as does your team, and so glad to, to, to know that you're out there uh, representing this in, in, in our, not only our uh, national society, but our international society. Uh, because I think we've all gone to places and seen ways that you realize didn't start there, but ended up there because right. it flowed through the oceans. Yeah. Um, I have to ask, is there any time where you're uh, in downtime hmm. where you're not thinking about waste or looking at something like, I know you like art. Yeah. So when you look at art, you're like, well, maybe that could be repurposed, reused, well, or it, recycled? No, or, certainly. Or, look, I mean, I, what do you do in your downtime? I love you know, looking at things differently, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I love spending time with my family. We have you know, three wonderful children, you know, one, on, one on the way. Um, right. And a big part of what I enjoy doing personally with my wife as well is, 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 is exactly what you described, facilitating. Uh, or, 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 or making the world more, more you know, artistic as much as possible. So um, we do a lot to try to support uh, the Trenton art scene, uh, especially all the graffiti art that comes out of there, which right. is absolutely phenomenal. So if you're ever through TerraCycle's headquarters, mm -hmm. it's covered in uh, beautiful graffiti art, all done by local uh, 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 artists. That changes almost every two, three weeks because it's become such a scene of folks coming. Um, but I think you know, the, we, we, especially as adults, have adult powers, right? And so why make the world gray and uh, why not make it filled with color? You know, not just from a business context, but just from a, you know, from an artistic context and live in that as much as possible. It's really rejuvenating. Well, I have to say, I stopped by, your staff was great. They gave me a copy of your book, so I stopped down to the office to pick it up. And I was reading it, and I was also looking around thinking, well, what in my life is, is reused? And I, I happened to be um, putting a, a, a couch, which I'm reusing, in a garage for uh, a moment, and there was a, a clock uh, in this person's garage. And it was a chime clock, and I realized, wait a minute, there's some beautiful pieces to this. Yeah. Yes, it's old, and the, and the frame is cracked, and it would be very expensive to try and fix, but in and of itself, the contents of it were just beautiful. So yeah. setting them aside. So you've had an effect on me already. Well, I'm glad. And I think, look, you can do a lot of fun with interior design, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the stuff we do, we either like build things from wood we find in the forest. And this area of Mercer County is covered in forests that you can go you know, scrounge amazing wood in to make things from. Mm -hmm. And there's always stuff on the side of the road. Uh, there's phenomenal right. flea markets. Uh, you know, there is so, and, and there's a lot of, uh, I think, digging through history in that way. Way, is incredibly fun, you know. Whether it's it's a flea market or go down to Lambertville and enjoy, you know, the uh, the more curated uh, versions of the same thing. Um, there's a lot to be said versus just going onto your favorite website and pressing the buy button. Tom, thank you for your time today. I'm so glad we had a chance to sit down. Um, I've uh, followed your story for, for some time, but uh, I must say in, in doing some research and, and learning more, I, I'm thrilled that you are part of our business community here, yeah. that you represent us on that international stage, and we wish you all the best from the set here at Mercer Influence. So thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to see you.
Join us again for our next episode. You can find us on Roku, uh, Apple TV, and we appreciate so much the support of the Mercer County Economic Association for their sponsorship. Have a great day. See you soon.